Welcome. We're, today we're going to go over uh, Made in China, Women Factory Workers in Global Workplace by Pun Nai, Introduction and Chapter One. Made in China, Pun Nai is a foremost Chinese labor sociologist, assistant professor at Hong Kong U of Science and Technology, and her book won the Big Sociology Award for Best Sociological Book, and it will be read in easily 100 years. This book is a modern classic. It gives voice to female migrant workers. Question, who makes all the products that you buy? Things that think about Walmart, where are they made? Well, if you answer China, you are correct. China is the world factory now. They produce and make almost everything that the world buys, particularly in stores like Target, Walmart, uh, uh, pretty much any any place in the United States, a lot of products are inevitably made in China. Another question, who is the U.S. in debt to? Now, if you name China, you're half right, half wrong. The first person that the U.S. is in most debt to is itself. The second, though, is China. Now, if you look at China, it has the same kind of landmass as the United States. United States has around 350 million people. China has uh, uh, the same landmass, but 1.3 billion people. So same amount of landmass, but 1 billion people more. So again, a lot of people always ask me, what is China like? Well, China with 1.3 billion people, 22% of the world, almost one in four people are Chinese in the world, is not one story. It's not even 10 stories. You have over 2,000 dialects. China could be easily 100 countries, easily. It's very diverse, it's culture, it's language. A lot, a lot of times uh, Chinese, when they go to different provinces that are not close to them, they feel like they're in a different country because it has a different language. Again, there's no one single or even one million stories singular of China. Chapter one, starts with a fire that killed many Chinese factory workers. Now, was this the first factory sweatshop fire in China? No, actually, there's quite a few of that uh, Chinese factory workers uh, were burned alive in a locked factory. Is this reminiscent of anything in the United States? Now, if you answer the Triangle Shirt Fire uh, uh, factory fire in New York, you are totally correct. That was uh, because of left Jewish activism, as well as Eastern European activism, as well as uh, immigrants from Italy, um, they actually fought against sweatshop conditions that happened in the early 1900s. And again, um, a lot of reminiscent of that stuff that happened in the United States, which is now outlawed, is still happening in China. Question, why do transnational corporations locate in China? Answer. Cheap labor, no environmental laws, workers, they work 12 to 18 hours. If you think about the United States Christmas, our Christmas is Chinese workers hell. For the preceding one month before, they work six to seven days a week and they make all these products that we open up in one day on Christmas. And then you look at uh, consumption trends, you know, you pretty, pretty much break or throw away within three months. So again, um, this is a very interesting time frame. Uh, so another reason why uh, uh, companies have gone to China is workers can also be consumers of the products they buy and also take polluting jobs out of China. There's a very famous book called Toxic Towns about I IBM and how they polluted a town in the Northeast and how everyone got cancer in that town. They're still actually presently still suing that IBM. And what IBM did is they took that company and they just moved to China. So again, um, that's another reason. Another reason is to get away from the US labor unions that are demanding fair rights. Now I highly recommend you read this book on globalization called The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century by Thomas Friedman. It's very interesting. It talks about how, uh, how uh, companies have, are moving to uh, other countries that have lower kind of standards of environmental laws and labor laws and the reason and the effect. And it makes actually a somewhat a startling claim before um, all the, you know, the kind of the dirty polluting jobs were moving to third world countries. But nowadays, particularly um, India and China, they're building thousands of colleges. And that in itself will also be a big difference in um, 
affecting the uh, the first world because why would you hire someone uh, an engineer from let's say sixty thousand United States when you can hire a hundred engineers in India keep them in, in India and actually have the same exact work if not ten times more and you don't have to give health or dental so again just like there has been a globalization shift in um, uh, working class low skilled work um, there will be a shift again so something to think about. Now, how does the system, how does the Chinese patriarchal um, system control young, young women? Well, these young women in China are called Dagomes or Dagong Mei's. Um, they're ch migrant ch uh, working daughters. They're controlled by their work is controlled because uh, they work in factories. Their education is controlled. Often you don't educate your daughter as much as your son. Um, their marriage is controlled by their family and mostly it's single uh, girls. Now, if you watch a documentary made in China, uh, a Mardi Gras made in China, uh, Roger, the manager of the sweatshop says, why do I have 90% women? Quote, because it's easy to control. Class subject. Now, the author argues that class consciousness struggle is highly contested in China. There's a lot of class struggle. They have an active part in, in struggle and they have agency. Something to note is the author talks about how, you know, it's very difficult to talk about just class in China because you have region dis differences, you have language differences, you have ethnic differences, you have religious differences. Again, we're talking about 1.4 or 1.3 billion people. So again, it's not class, it would be just too simple of analysis of looking at the diversity of China. I invite you now to pause this and, and, and type in John Stewart Fear Factory, and there you will see um, a, a great kind of communic uh, what's happening, kind of communic uh, video on what's happening in Chinese factories. Now, class in China. The author argues class is not only a fluid historical relationship, but also a specific relationship that contains many human tensions, multiple structural contradictions, and sometimes even self defeating elements. So, in a nutshell, I would like you to pause and I want you to think about it and write down what this means. These are pictures of factories and, you know, the transformation of uh, historically. This is what a uh, factory would sometimes typically eat, rice, meat, soup, and some eggs. Um, so you're probably wondering why, why is it that, you know, so many uh, thousands of companies have moved to places like Shenzhen? Well, because you're thinking, well, isn't China a communist state? You're right. Nominally, China is, is communist. But they have this thing called SARS, which is means special administrative region. Hong Kong is one of them. Shenzhen is one of them. Those special areas is where capitalism is especially allowed. So number one, a special economic zone where capitalism can't exist or a SAR, special administrative region. Uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen is one of them. They attract Chinese from all over. Remember, if you're born in, uh, uh, if you're born in uh, a place any place, let's say 95% uh, usually is a farming place, you have to live there forever, you cannot move. And so in order to move, you'd have to actually get a special permission, which is a huku. Now, Shenzhen is close to Hong Kong. It's an immigrant city and also a local states uh, helps uh, foreign capital. Uh, I will do an interactive assignment uh, in class. And that is the end of chapter one. And I will see you in class. I hope you learned something.